It's Sunday at sunrise. This is an opportunity to share with you the fifth principle of Afro-economics, God, including God into every aspect of our life. And in some way or another, I feel that when um, we think about our financial decisions and we hear the words Afro-economics, we start just thinking about money. So I put God at the core of Afro-economics, even in the book, you know, that, and, and this, these Sundays allow me to pull out, you know, verse after verse and, and how um, God is at the core of everything that we do. And there's, there's a lot in the word that talks specifically about wealth development and, and things. And today's discussion, you know, is really about just staying awake and the, the urgency of now, right? The, um, and I, I, I think when, when I post this, I'm going to put stay woke. <laughs> I remember I said that in a podcast in the studio, and I remember the engineer working in the studio, he stopped me, and he said, okay, JB, we're going to do that again, and this time say, stay awake. <laughs> I said, when you get home, I want you to tell your kids what you just did to me. He said, huh? I said, yeah, okay, I'm, all, I'm good. We can keep the stay woke. <laughs> But I do know the difference that that was that was funny. So I hope that like made you smile this morning. So I do know the difference, but I seriously want us to stay woke. Yes, indeed. I want us to make sure that we are realizing the importance of our existence. You know, the, the that we're realizing that your your life can make a difference for generations and generations to come. So when I sent out the invitation, I had this picture. You see the picture behind me? You know, and that was on the invitation. Make sure you go to afroeconomics.com so that you can get the weekly invites and kind of a sneak peek into the topic. And then, and I will go, like, I might tell you a topic and I'm gonna go wherever I wanna go. God tells me to go with it. But I saw this quote last week, and it said, the true meaning of life. Now, this is the man, that's his, that's his opinion. The true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. And that's um, Nelson Henderson. But those are some powerful words. Plant trees and create shade like those trees are gonna grow up and they're gonna create comfort and opportunity for people that you may never meet and that's the first principle of afro economics legacy discovering your why you know why god put us here to not just drop seeds you know but to when we drop seeds, think about what you're planting. Think about what it's for. Think about where you're going with it. Good morning, Mr. Dorsey. Think about it. Think, think, think about what is the purpose of why I'm laying this down. You know, your life is to create a better way for those you may not ever me and that is okay because a lot of times you, you, you know you'll you'll say well uh, you know if you do this and i if i if i do these things and if i leave it for the the kids what if they don't appreciate it what if they you know no it's not that's you know god does things for us and often it goes unappreciated but he still does it for us. And the things that he does for us that we may take for granted, he may be doing it for us, for the person who is living off the comforts of what God blessed us with. Because see, our blessings are designed to flow through us. 
So as you love on God, God loves on you. And what happens is everyone around you gets the benefit of that love that you are getting and sharing. You know, they get that benefit. So, so you're providing that tree, that comfort, you know, and you may not even know it. And God is using you to provide it to someone to help them see, you know, how from whom your blessings flow. That's why we have to give honor to him and, and realize that that's where our peace can flow and does flow from. And I thought it was interesting this morning. I was, um, you know, telling you all about, you know, this morning, usually on Sunday mornings, I'll like skip skip over the exercise but this morning I said no I'm gonna get mine I'm gonna you know do some exercise I can I can do it I'm up up this early so the and then this morning it allowed I started just looking at um trees so I was like what is your what is my favorite tree like my favorite tree and I if we hadn't talked about this today I, I wouldn't even have uh, thought about it like finding out more about my favorite tree but my favorite tree is the red like the the red oak like the um and I'm, I'm gonna share I'm gonna share it with you now we're talking about realizing staying awake realizing the purpose of our life and realizing how important it is you know in in Proverbs it says don't close your eyes don't think that there's a time in your life. Like, you know, this was this inspired by Proverbs chapter six, verse four, basically tells us, stay woke. Don't fold your arms. Keep it going. That whole Proverbs chapter six is pretty strong as far as, you know, motivating us. You know? So this being my favorite tree, can, I hope you can see this red oak. Like, look at it, like how beautiful it is. You know, but interesting enough, this is from um, Better Homes and Gardens. <laughs> it says that it takes 20 to 30 years to reach full size. And if they're a fast grower, 10 to 15 years. And the good news is the red maple grows at medium speed. So that equals about 12 to 18 inches in height. So it could take about 25 years before it stops adding new growth. 25 years. These, these then, this tree could provide shade for over a hundred years. When I looked at it, it said like this, this tree, like depending on how you take care of it, right? making sure that you have, you know, the, tro the proper care of the tree. The, like, look in this one. Look, look, look in, this, in this, this, this picture now. And the person who took this picture was probably just a photographer. The person who wrote the article was a, probably a person, most likely, that actually knows about the red oak tree. So in this article, it says, you must make sure that you plant this tree at least six feet from a sidewalk because the roots of this tree are at the surface. So this tree will buckle up the sidewalk. Now, if they wanted to, to provide this picture for me to show me what not to do, but look at what they did. Like this is right here at the sidewalk. So this probably, you know, isn't fully grown, or if it does grow anymore, it can bust that sidewalk up. Now, if that tree busts up the sidewalk, whose fault is it? You know, is it the person that laid down the sidewalk, or is it the person that planted the tree that close to the sidewalk? Right? So, I mean, that just shows you how early in life is how early in life that, yeah, is it, it is a sidewalk. You know, Mike was asking that, that is it a sidewalk? Yeah, it's a sidewalk, it's a cement. I don't know if y'all, 
Um, but I'm, I'm gonna go back. <laughs> I share it with y'all. Look, it'd be funny. I'm just, I just, I just go back, and then I don't um let y'all see it. And I go, yeah, it's just a, it's um the okay. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna show you, and then I'm gonna go in here. And then I'm gonna share. Good question. And the because if it is just a path, the um if it's just a path, then you'd be all good, right? But see, what they did was, there's that building. And then that's why I'm figuring, look, because there's it's, it's chairs all in the building. I don't know what type, but it is a building, and building where people come in. And it looks like that's a good point. I'm not sure. If it is, not, but look, this part right here suggests to me, but this part right here suggested it's a sidewalk. He said he didn't have his glasses on, but neither do I. But I don't know. But if it is a sidewalk, we know that that could be a problem. But this looks pretty dirty to me. But this part up here looks more like a sidewalk. But look how perfect it is. They could have actually thought through if the roots, because if it is a path, well, either way, I guess, according to the expectations of this tree, it's going to soon be in the path. So it will still be a hazard because people are going to start tripping over it. So the, um, I guess my feeling like, oh, that's not that bad because, because really the sidewalk is not going to stop the roots. I mean, think about that in your own life. Know that God already knows what is needed to get you to full, to get us to full, to get the tree to full, what his purpose is for our life. He knows our end at our beginning. He knows where the tree is going already. So the sidewalk cannot stop the tree. Our turbulence, our problems, our confusion, any, you know, not COVID, you know, recession, you know, depression, it cannot stop God's purpose over your life unless we give it to it. So if we get to, if we get and you know, we don't all of a sudden, we don't want the root, you don't want to expand, you don't want to go, so you start just chopping off and cutting off your potential, you know, then that is the damage, that is the damage that can be done to the potential that God already gave you because God knows your fullness. God knows the shade that you can provide. But if you decide to do certain things that are going to kill it, you know, if you don't water it, and water might be equal to our skills, our education, and definitely our relationship with God. You know, if you don't give ourselves seeing ourselves as a tree, if we don't give us what we need, then we're not going to get to where God already knows we can get. Like, it's about us having the faith, because if he put it in our mind, I mean, if it doesn't happen, it's only because we don't have the faith to feed it, to feed his purpose over our life what it truly needs. If you need water, but you're giving it soda, it doesn't give it what it needs. If you need skill, but you just chilling, it doesn't give it what it needs. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They have like a tree. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. That's Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in God. Because like you can allow, like we can allow the sidewalks, the paths, these external things, 
you know, to slow down our potential, the job loss, you know, and anything, you know, losing someone, you know, but we have to trust the peace, 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 P-E-A-C-E, peace belongs to the person who puts his confidence, put our confidence in God so that our tree so that our tree can fully grow, so that our lives can fully blossom, so that we can live up to our full potential. But the amazing part of it, if we think of it as, as we, you know, God may see us as individuals, like, you know, they, you see that the research says to get to this full grown tree, it may take 25, 30 years. And then after that, it can live 100 years. And it's doing its purpose to provide shade, to be beautiful, to feed the wildlife. You know, that, it is, that is its purpose. It's living its full purpose. So this, how does that relate to our life? Are we planting things on this planet, this planet? that can provide comfort and peace and provision for people that we'll never see. Can, are we doing things with our life and our daily opportunities that will make a difference to everyone, not just your wallet, not just your kid's wallet? but your kids and your kids and your kids and your kids and everyone associated. Because see, a lot of times we talk about the importance of entrepreneurship. And we just think it's because it's a job, you know, but the, the importance of entrepreneurship is the tree that you're building because the tree has branches. So when you start a business, you hire people to help you. And then when you hire people and you help them, you're helping them feed their family. And then their family has provision and they start businesses. And then there's, that's the big tree of life. And that's why, you know, that's why, you know, we should be encouraged to do things that can help someone to live out our purpose. Uh, people that have opportunities to supervise and manage people and they're working in this big corporation and say they have three four five hundred people under them working and they become the example that God has asked them to do like the the, the peace and the comfort and the support and the motivation and the, the commitment that they make to making sure that their staff, you know, or, or to have their business, their employees are happy and that they're fair and they're honest and they give them livable wages. You know, because see, we live in a world that says, it's okay, build your tree, do whatever you got to do, suck up all the water. Take up everything, go through the sidewalk, bust it up, tear up the path, do whatever you got to do so that your tree grows. But that's not God's plan. God says that I will give you a tree if you believe in me that will always be green. So you don't have to go around hurting anybody. You always have green leaves. You're always, you know, you can make sure that you plant yourself in a position that it will do no harm to anyone. Be six feet away. Think about the impact of what you do today and how it will impact others as you go down the road. Because if you're only thinking about what I can make, how much I can accumulate, you're not thinking about where you're planting yourself, where you're planting those trees to help other people, what you're doing, because you're not conscious on that level when you're not including God in all of your decisions. 
right? But but we have to make sure that we do include a level of long term consciousness and the impact of it so that even if we don't enjoy the shade of the trees that we're planting that we can find comfort in knowing we have consciously made steps to make for a better world because we're in it everybody should do that like i want you look just you know we should all say i want to make sure that the world is better because I came by this way, right? So, so in Hebrews chapter six, verse 10, it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. You know, so that we don't have to worry that, oh, well, if I do, if I do it this, if I do this, if I plant, and do my thing in a way that's going to disturb the peace of others and harm people, then I, I, that it's okay. No, it's not. God says you don't have to do that. Like I saw this movie and it was talking about DuPont it was gone in this community in West Virginia and they were putting toxins, you know, into the water and it was killing the people. You know, and it took one lawyer from that town to listen to, and he had moved away to the city and he was listening, you know, and he had, they, they had to, he had to listen and realize that God will not forget your work because he went through, it was like 20 years, 20 years of fighting for those people. And fortunately, his firm stood by because you're talking about a law firm that protects companies like DuPont deciding that they're going to protect the people because what they're doing is wrong. They lost a lot of money, but they invested in doing the right thing. I mean, the man got sick. His family had the struggle. They, they cut his salary. You know, they was uh, it, it, it's like a good movie. I think it's called Blue Water or something like that. But it's about, I mean, that's a prime example. And at the end, you know what I'm saying? He was justified and he was able to help some people from dying. But the people who died and the babies from birth defects and, you know, they saw it and the company just pushed it to the side. And when I work with people, and I'm trying to protect them, and they're working with professionals that refuse to allow the, the customer to get the protection that they deserve. You know, and I'm going through that um, with someone's accountant, and the accountant doesn't want to talk to me, you know, and it's been like three weeks, and it's hurting the client because they keep going back and forth, but the accountant will not talk with all three of us, even though I'm not trying to take his business. I'm only trying to protect the client, but I am not going to stop. And I told them, I said, it's only up to you to allow that behavior to continue, but you have to allow. Now, it took a lot of nerve for those people in West Virginia to stand up to DuPont. They were robbing their house, taking evidence out of their freezers. They were, you know, they were doing everything they could to intimidate those people. You know, this is going on. This is in, we're talking about in this, these times. This is just settled like within the last five years or so. You know, but God says he will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. I find comfort in that. You know, I find comfort in that. In the, in the, in, in Psalms one, um, chapter 102, verse 18, let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. So that if we live our life committed to God's direction of doing well and for others and looking out for those who need help, then the next generation will inherit that commitment from us. 
I believe because I come from it, that, that service is in my DNA. You know, that, that my, my father, my, both of my parents are educators. You know, that, that, that is a service. You know, I remember my father saying how committed he was and, and lived his whole life in motivating black males to get further their education, using himself as an example of getting his PhD from New York University in the 70s. And when I look at that and I think about how hard that must have been, you know, with four kids, and he went back and forth from New York to Delaware, you know, with us, you know, doing that, but he did it. And it created that commitment to education and service within us. So, and then, and then also in Proverbs, remember this was like my main inspiration was um, to do not sleep. In Proverbs chapter six, verse four, it says, do not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Don't close your eyes to the reality of what's going on. Like some people don't want to see the truth. Like Twyla, they'll, they'll turn their back on it and they'll know that this I should help this person. Mm, 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 mm. So we have to think about where is our heart? Like we have to become generous of heart, right? And in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 10, it says, now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will be lifted up. The power of doing it now. If it takes 25 years, 30 years to get full blossom of the tree, if you wait three, four, five, what are you doing? You're putting off the full growth. You're putting off the ability for it to provide shade to those who need it. So, so I mean, and I feel that this is our time. Like we can plant seedlings and little trees, or we can plant just small seeds, but we have to plant something. And your, your, your time could be your seed because I believe we all have time. We all have time. We just have the decision of you get to decide how much time that you're going to give. But I think that we're falling short. Like, you know, I was looking at someone's post today and I had no idea the county where I was born um, in Bertie County, North Carolina, <laughs> said that the tornado hit that hard. I don't have like because my mother is not there. She's going through um, some health things with us in Virginia. So I had no idea. Like, and she's at my sister's house right now, and I'm gonna call and ask. Like, the pictures were outrageous. I had no idea. But think about like, and what what do they need? You know that that we have to like reach out. You know, and say like, what do I need? Well, so some, you know, immediately someone um, said, oh, put money in the cash app. You know, it's hard for me to believe that I'm going to help my cousin and by putting money into a cash app that's going to the county. So there in Matthew chapter three, verse 16, Jesus answered to him saying, permit it at this time. For in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. I believe that is for us to be proactive, you know, that we need to actually see like what is actually needed, you know, for that, like, and you don't have to go far away, but I just feel that, you know, we, I feel that having these discussions on the Sunday morning, that it is my way of being proactive about our relationship with God and how we um, see God involved in our daily living, especially from a financial point of view. And I want to reiterate that the cash app is just not the answer to everything. 
Sometimes it's just taking the time to check on somebody or taking the time to actually ask, you know, or taking the time, you know what I mean, to to go by or or see or taking the time, you know, to, whatever it is, it's not always just money. And I think that when you don't have money, then you think that you don't have anything to give. But your time is so valuable. I mean, think about the time that it takes for something to actually grow to its fullness that God has for it. So let's make sure that we're effectively using that time. In Luke chapter 2, verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, you are, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. That we have this freedom to do what God has put us here to do. We definitely have the freedom to do it. And sometimes we limit ourselves because we don't realize how free we are because we're thinking about what we don't have or what we can't do or where we aren't, you know what I'm saying? Instead of thinking about, you know, what exactly can I do? And I mean, at the least, not even the least of it, but it doesn't cost anything to pray. It really doesn't. I had a, a member whose husband passed away and his birthday was recently. And I really did not know what to do. So I just prayed for her and her family. That, I mean, that's, that, is, that is according to as we've been told. And I believe it. It's the most powerful thing that we can do. To proactively pray. To pray and accept that and have faith that that is going to her family will be comforted by my desire for her to have comfort, for them to feel the love from God and to feel the love and to, and to realize how blessed they are to have had her husband and father for the time that they did. Mm. And now the God of peace be with you. You know, that's, that's in Romans chapter 15, verse 33. I just know, like now, it didn't say like tomorrow, Let's be at peace. But it says, now the God of peace be with you. You know, like that is how God, how positive God wants us to be now. He wants us to plant our seeds and our seedlings and grow our trees now. Because now is of the essence. Because look how long it takes for it to grow to where God, to provide its full service. So we need to be careful what we do, how we speak, how we interact, how we motivate. Mm. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. It is the spirit who gives life. And that's in John chapter 6, verse 33. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh has no help. The flesh is no help at all. Not something. So that, again, tells them, that's in John chapter 6, verse 33. It is the spirit who gives life. You know how real that is? When, when, you, can, when you say, like, someone will come into the environment and you'll say, like, you know, I don't know, they, their spirit, their spirit is wrong. Like, you know, there is a spirit that gives life, and there's a spirit, you know, that, that can take it. It just sucked the air, sucked the God out of the whole experience. Teresa says, plenty of time to grow our own food and our community prior priorities. Time is our commodity. Mm. Yes, indeed, Teresa. Plenty of time to grow our own food and our community priorities. Right? I have a, a client that's trying to donate land, you know, to one of the HBCUs. He's having the hardest time. That's what he wants them to do, to grow a community garden. I'm going to check back on that because, you know, all this does, like COVID has slowed it down. But 
this is more of the time. Like Teresa said, this is time. We got to drop them seeds. We got to, you know, I don't know. You know, right now I feel like I need to tell him, you know what? Let's just start it. Like, just turn it into a garden. Do it. You, they, you don't need their approval. And maybe then the community will see it. The school will see it, you know, and accept like that. Oh, or I can help him create his own nonprofit, you know, and he can create the community garden. Mm-hmm. You are growing your own food, Twyla. Wow. Teresa says the sheep knows God's voice and follow his voice. Indeed. Mr. Dorsey says human interaction is very necessary. Thank you so much, Twyla. Aunt. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Human touch heals. I did. I did. Like, you know, that is so true. That is so true. Human touch heals. And I was looking at something last week and they were talking about that, how important. And I remember, you know, when you're thinking about human touch, I remember uh, when I went to um, University of Virginia undergrad and I never had a black professor. And then when I got into the business school, the business law teacher was this black woman. And she was walking around the classroom and asking questions and things. I loved the class. I loved her. And um, she touched me. Like she touched my shoulder. And then I thought, in all the years that I've been at UVA, that was like my third year, that no teacher had ever felt comfortable enough to touch my shoulder. Like, you know, I mean, I can get it that, you know, but, you know, I had a lot of white females, a lot of white male teachers, you know, and the rest of the whole experience there. But when that lady touched me, she touched my shoulder, a piece came over me that I felt real. Like it almost wants me, makes me that, um, makes me want to cry, but that it hurts when I think about my daughter having gone to like her entire high school experience, middle school experience, elementary school experience, she had one, one teacher that was black, a black male teacher. And one student told her that he was gonna hit her in the face and he moved her away instead of moving the person who threatened to assault her. And all of the white kids in the class, it was a little Asian boy, all of the white kids were like, what did you say? They were appalled by it. And when I brought it up to the teacher, the black male, he said, oh, I don't remember. I don't remember it happening. <laughs> and the boy said he was going to hit my daughter in the face. Like, you know, and I said, yeah, you did because you moved her to another group. And he said, oh, Oh, I said, I just don't understand why you would move the victim instead of the one who assaulted, you know, her. But it makes you think, y'all, where, you know, we need to love on each other, love on each other, love on one another, love on one another. I feel that a lot of the pain that we um, are experiencing Instead of us, you know, seeing like, whoa, you know, like I was reading a story and I was, I'm in this discussion group and there was this post and it was talking about this white male that was like saying all these racial slurs. And I said, well, he needs help, you know, and everybody went into attack mode that no, he's just mean, he's just mean, he's just mean, you know, but that's exactly the way that um, many communities see our people that are hurting that a lot of times we act out because of pain they act out because of pain like that that pain you know needs to be addressed and in order for you know me to ask you to acknowledge my pain and to acknowledge my disc the discrimination to acknowledge the damage that's you know generational discrimination and affect the effect of it, 
I first have to acknowledge the effect that it's had on you. How can we both go through the same thing and it not impact you? It only impacted me. That's a lie. There's a whole bunch. If you are that afraid of a black male that he jogs down the street and you have to run after him and shoot him, that's a challenge. That's a problem. You are sick. And it needs, we need to have empathy, you know, about it so that they can actually notice the empathy that is desired. You know what I mean? Not sympathy, the empathy. You need to realize the diseases, the generational um, poverty, the lack of a livable wage, you know, all of these things, that compassion, like, but we got to bring God into this discussion. You know, this isn't as much a BLM issue as it is a G-O-D issue. That if we bring God and humanity front and center into this discussion about racism, you know what I mean? The entire discussion will change on both sides, on both sides, because it is only God, not some sponsorship or some money given to BLM that's going to change the way someone views me. It's only God that can change a heart. So all this money throwing around and TV commercials and painting over there, you know, it's not going to change law enforcement's view of me, right? Until, and God, only God can change a heart. Only God can change a heart. And that's when the, um, Twyla says, because this side, society does not look at black females as victims. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? The, um, even with law enforcement, the tactics with black females is much more aggressive versus their female counterparts. Exactly. Our society, even in schools, always view black girls as capable of taking care of themselves. This is why we can't receive um, commensurate justice. It's so true. You see, it's like, that's, you know that, um, was it Sojourner or I think Sojourner Douglas who says um, that, you know, ain't I a woman? You know the poem? Like the, um, it's that, thank you, indeed. We're not asking for enough sympathy. We just need, you know, and we need to, you know, there's, there's no, the reason that our society in every way hasn't advanced the way it should is because we're not looking at the core of the problem. The core of the problem is love. You know, it's just love. And we as black females don't receive empathy for that reason alone. Historically, we have proven to be survivors, but that doesn't always translate into being thrivers. No, especially with this COVID, they're saying that we, um, that we, that black females, you know what I mean? And, and um, Latino females are hitting, going to be hit the hardest by this. Like, the, but because of, if the kids can't go to school, who typically has custody? Who typically is in a job that is a service industry and they're cutting back and, you know, who, you know, but the biggest issue is we generally are in jobs that don't even have, you know, a livable wage. I was looking at research that they did in Baltimore City, and it showed six years after college, four-year college degree, they followed these students. Six years after completing a four-year college degree, only 24% of the college graduates had a livable wage, 24%. So the overwhelming majority, you know, so the, that definitely, definitely, Twala said, gravely impacts our families, gravely. We're, um, we're living in a society that says it's okay for you to work 40 hours a week and not be able to live. Mm. And we live in a society that says it's okay to allow people to write off their mortgage interests, but it's a problem when we have to subsidize housing because these people are working 
and still not making enough to have housing. So, and you're putting more, you're losing more money by allowing the mortgage interest to be written off than you're spending in subsidizing housing. But you would rather help the rich or those who can get a mortgage, you would rather help them than to actually help those who cannot afford to live in a safe place. Like the, that, that I have a problem with. So let's pray that God becomes part. You can't add humanity into the discussion because, you know, we have a Congress that's gridlocked. And we talked about this last night, you know, Romans, I mean, last week, Romans chapter 13. You know, we got to pray for those people. Who in the world, who in the world would think it's okay to go take a break from work while people are depending on you to eat? And who, I don't care what political party you're in, we should be outraged. And But too many people don't have the problem. So because we don't have the problem, you don't think it's your concern. But that's not what the word says. We are instructed in the word for us to take care of those in need. That's what we've been told to do. That's, I mean, that's not even an option. That's what, we're, that's what we've been instructed to do. Wake up, stay awake. Be alert. Know this. Know this. Mm. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Anything that's unjust, you have to know, is not of God. Mm. So let's put our time into that. Yeah, and it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And that's John chapter 6, verse 63. And I hope that that is true for my words as well. God bless y'all. Thank you for sharing your morning with me. You're the best. I'm J.B. Bryan. My email is jb at jbbryan.com. Let me know if you need me in any way. Pray for me as I pray for you. I want the best for you. you know, let's make sure we plant. Look, make sure we 